On the table in front of me are all the things that I used to go bikepacking and all of the things that I took to the recent Atlas mountain race in Morocco. From the clothing that I wore to the sleep system I used, how I kept my gear charged and how I rode at night. In this video, I'm gonna break down everything that I took with me and everything that I recommend you guys take or don't take on your first bikepacking adventure. A quick note on this, if you haven't seen the Atlas Mountain Race documentary, please go and give it a watch. It's gonna give a lot more context to this entire video. Without further ado, let's get into it. This is my complete bikepacking breakdown. Okay, so let's get into it. I suppose the first place to start with a bike packing breakdown is with the bike itself. This is obviously the most important component of what you're gonna need if you're gonna go bike packing. I'm gonna refer specifically to the bike that I used at the Atlas Mountain Race, but everybody can use a different bike depending on where you're going, the kind of terrain you're riding on, and uh, the level of comfort that you need and want. So for me, in the Atlas Mountains, I was riding this bike. This is the BMC Four Stroke LT. This is a 120 millimeter dual suspension mountain bike. The reason I used this one in the Atlas Mountain race is because I needed a bike that was going to offer a lot of comfort especially in the second half of the race where my body was really really tired. Having the suspension on the bike allowed my body to relax and especially when my wrist was really really damaged it gave me just that bit more comfort on my hands and on my arms and my upper body so that I could kind of flow through those more rough more rocky more technical sections with more comfort. One of the funny things at Atlas specifically was that a lot of guys looked at my bike beforehand and were like that's an absolutely huge bike why are you bringing a bike so big how are you going to lug that up 20 thousand meters of climbing in the Moroccan desert. What was interesting was that by the end, a lot of people were coming up to me and saying, I wish I had your bike. Why did I not bring a bigger bike? So it's really important when you're doing these events to look at how long the event is and look at how rough the terrain is throughout. Don't just go for the bike that you think is going to be fastest when you're absolutely flat out. Think about the bike that's going to allow you the most amount of comfort so that your body can handle the entire length of the event without giving up. One of the things with this bike that I really, really liked was the lockout. On the left-hand side, I had the lockout lever and that allowed me to run the suspension either either fully locked out, half locked out, or fully unlocked. With that fully unlocked suspension, I got the full range of motion out of that 120 millimeters front and rear. With it semi-locked out, it was just a bit firmer. And so when I was climbing up hills where it was still rocky, but I needed that pedaling efficiency, the semi-lockout was really, really useful for that. And then the full lockout I used on the road so I didn't have any bobbing at all. And I also used it on some of the smoother off-road uphill sections. Some people get a bit concerned about the extra weight that you get from suspension. I actually don't think it's that much of an issue. I think that if you're a reason rider, the benefits you get from having suspension outweigh the disadvantages that you have from a little bit extra weight in the suspension there. I had SRAM AXS on there with a 34 tooth chainring up the front and I had a 1050 on the back. So an electronic group set. This was an interesting point. This actually led to my sort of RSI and my thumb, the small button pressing continually that got quite sore after a while. And that was actually what caused a bit of pain in my thumb. I did try adjusting the position of the shifter when I was really, really sore and it didn't really make too much difference. I do think that this probably could have happened whether I'd had mechanical or whether I'd even had Shimano on there as well. So I don't want to tell you guys that it's the right or the wrong shifter to use. That group set was really, really good. I had no issues with the gearing. 34 on the front was great. The 50 tooth on the back allowed me to get up anything and the 120 millimeters of suspension gave me the option to get down anything as well. If you've watched the documentary, you would have seen that I actually only got this bike a few days before the event and I only changed two things on it from stock. The first thing I changed was the stem. So it came with a 50 millimeter stem, but I changed that for a 70 millimeter stem. And then the second thing I changed was the saddle. The bike came with quite a hard kind of mountain bike road saddle that I didn't want to ride. So I swapped it out for a softer WTB gravel saddle that was actually really, really good in the Atlas Mountains. It was a very comfortable saddle and it gave me the ability to ride for those long days without getting too uncomfortable. The aero bars that I was using on the bike, I borrowed off Christian Meyer. He very kindly lent them to me. These are a VAP aero bar setup, So they clamp on to the bars as a third party system. There's a small carbon rod that goes through the middle where you can attach accessories like a computer mount there, or you can also attach some uh, extra little bar ends like I've got on there, which are really good for when you're on the aero bars. There's a, a special pad that goes on the elbow there as well, which you can see in all of the clips, basically. I was really happy I took those. That meant that on the road sections and the faster gravel sections, and even in some of the climbs, not only could I change up my hand position, but that I could be way more aero and I was just sliding through the air that much 
much more easily. There were guys who didn't have aero bars who definitely said they should have run aero bars after the fact. If you are doing an adventure race, I would recommend adding some kind of bar system that gives you the ability to change hand positions. So for me to be able to go from the ends there to the aero bars was really, really nice, especially when my wrist was incredibly sore. And it was also good for just all of my fingers and posture and things like that to be able to change up the position. If you're not a fan of aero bars, I do recommend running some kind of bar ends or something that's just gonna give your body a rest for those periods where you've been in the same position for a long period of time. The only thing I would say with those specific bars is that because they were metal clamping onto carbon, they'd been slipping around a little bit in testing, but when I got to Marrakesh, I actually clamped them on with a small bit of rubber inner tube on the inside of the clamp. It helped, but it didn't stop them from sliding completely. So I found over the course of the race, they would slide up as I was riding, and then eventually I'd push them down, I would re-tighten them, they would slide up again. So not the ideal setup, but a really helpful setup and highly, highly recommended. So let's move on to the bags now and talk about my bag setup. So for the Atlas Mountain Race, I ran a small Apigura five liter racing saddlebag on the rear. I ran an Apigura top tube. I believe it's called a long top tube bag. And then on the front, I had an Ortlieb nine liter handlebar bag, which has got a roll on both ends that you can kind of roll up. That actually became really, really difficult when my wrist was really damaged. But that nine liter bag contained a lot of clothing and the things that I could kind of stuff into it and really fill out without it being too heavy. If you watch the film, you would have seen that I actually tested the bike with different bags to what I ended up using. In the days leading up to the race, I was using Ortlieb bags to practice with. Ortlieb kindly gave me a bunch of bags that I could choose from. On the rear, I had the big Ortlieb 12 liter saddle bag. The difficulty with that was that when I went to test the bike, I actually ended up folding the big saddle bag underneath because it got caught on the tire on one of the downhill sections. I realized at that moment that there was no way I was gonna be able to run a massive 12 liter saddle bag. I was gonna to have to find a smaller solution. So I went with that smaller Apigura bag. I put all my food in there. In the long top tube bag, I had chargers, I had zip ties, I had my spares. I had some food in there as well and a couple of other bits and pieces. And that meant that I could access those things really quickly. Those were gonna be the most necessary things to access in a pinch. And then in the front bag, I had the more bulky but lighter things like my sleep system. I had some extra clothing. In terms of any changes that I would have made to my bag setup at Atlas, I didn't really have too many issues and I was pretty happy with my bag setup. I think I would have done something different with the front bag so that I could have accessed things a little bit more easily. Maybe it was just the way I packed the bags, but there were a few moments when I really struggled with my wrist and I needed to pack the bag and then pull things out. Maybe a roll top bag is a better option if you're really struggling in that sort of sense. But yeah, overall, I was relatively happy with my bag setup. All right, so moving on to the clothing that I took to Atlas Mountain Race, I'm just gonna speak about the race here. I'm not gonna speak much about bike packing because clothing that you take is gonna depend on exactly where you're going and things like that. In the Atlas Mountain Race itself, the weather conditions in the lead up to the event were saying it was gonna be between about 10 degrees and 32 or 33 degrees. So I knew I was gonna be pretty right with mainly summer kit and then I took a few extra accessories. So the things that I wore were a pair of attack all day bib shorts. I just took one pair of bib shorts. If you guys have been following me for a little while now, you'll know how much I love the attack all day bib shorts. I actually made a vlog specifically around these bib shorts about this time last year. This is the same pair of bib shorts that I wore in that vlog 12 months ago and they're still going strong although I think it's time to retire them after wearing them for five days straight at this race. They have a cargo pocket in the side. They've got a nice thick chamois and a really really comfortable fabric. By far my favorite bib shorts to wear. I've never had any issues with them and are highly recommended. I put a link to these ones down below in the description if you do want to check those out. There's also a discount code down there so you can grab yourself a discount on some attacker kit if you want to. So the next thing I took was the attacker lightweight climbers jersey. This is a very thin fabric short sleeve jersey, really good for summer, it was really good for those hot days. And then when it gets cold, I put a summer weight base layer underneath to add a little bit of warmth. I then wore a regular gilet over the top of that if it got even colder. And then I had a pair of arm warmers and a pair of leg warmers with me to keep me warm. A couple of extra accessories that I had with me that I got some good use out of was the buff. I definitely use a buff when it gets cold. These things pack down really small and when you open them up and you put them on, you find that keeping your neck warm actually keeps the rest of your body quite warm as well. So there was that morning that I was out on that road and I was kind of in the middle of nowhere and I was wearing basically all my kit, including the buff. And I'm really glad I had the buff for that moment. I then took two pairs of gloves. I had a long finger pair of mountain bike gloves. These are really, really good for when it was really, really rough. It helps keep the calluses off your hands and things like that. And then I also had a pair of short finger gloves for that first day, but I found after wearing them on the first day, I didn't actually wear them too much more after that. So gloves were 
are a must, long finger and short finger. They don't take up too much room, so you can have both. A buff is always a really good idea. I go a lightweight summer jersey over like a merino t-shirt or something like that because I find I like the pockets in the jersey. And then on top of that, I also had this lightweight packable rain jacket, which I find is super, super useful. I almost didn't take a rain jacket with me, but I'm glad I did because it rained on that first night and I got really good use out of this lightweight rain jacket. This is also from Attacker. They don't make this one anymore, but I've had it for a few years. And the fact that it packs down really, really small is really, really nice for those days when you just want to have something in your back pocket or packed into the bag and it will save your ass if you get caught in the rain like I did without expecting it to be there. Ah, and on top of that, I will just add, I also wore a pair of Merino socks for the entire time. Merino socks are really, really good for uh, the fact that they don't really smell too bad and they don't feel too bad. And also if your feet get wet, they don't stay wet. Your feet are gonna stay warm in those Merino wool socks. So a pair of Merino socks is really good. You can wear them for multiple days on end. And then the final piece of kit that I took with me, which was not actually a piece of cycling kit, was a lightweight down jacket. Now I've had this down jacket for a couple of years. I take this on all my bikepacking trips. It stuffs down really, really small. It's really, really light. I think this thing only weighs 180 grams or something like that. You can wear it on the bike, you can wear it off the bike. Even if you go in summer, this thing will save you if it gets chilly in the evenings. In terms of sunglasses, now this is a really interesting one. Obviously very, very personal, but for me, I ran a set of Oakley Jawbreaker sunglasses. I've run these sunglass frames for a long, long time. And more importantly, I had the photochromic lens in them, which varies between the middle of the night when you need it to be clear and the middle of the day when you've got full sun. I found the photochromic lens on these Oakley's excellent. You can get a photochromic lens on lots of different brands of sunglasses and for bikepacking, it's great. There are a couple of times at night when I took these off and I found that the wind and the dust in my eyes was actually killing me. So having a photochromic lens I was able to wear at night was very, very valuable, very useful. And I'd highly recommend a set of photochromic glasses if you're going bikepacking. Okay, so let's talk about hydration. This is a really critical part of bikepacking and going long distances without resupply. In the middle of nowhere, both of those situations were apparent at Atlas Mountain Race where we had up to 100 kilometers without resupply. I had 3.75 liters of water with me. That was my carrying capacity. I had a 750 milliliter bidden on the bike. I only have one bottle cage on the bike without adding some kind of third party additional mount to the underside of the down tube or onto the forks, which some people do. I didn't want to do that. So running the one bottle on the bike. Then I had a running vest. This is a nice lightweight running vest. It's called a Salomon Sense 5 Pro. Originally designed for running, these things are becoming really, really popular in ultra cycling. They're very, very lightweight. I had a two liter bladder in the back of that. The really nice thing about running a bladder there is the fact that you can have the hose running really close to your face. And when I needed to drink, I could just pop that in my mouth. I could put my hands back on the handlebars and I could keep my eyes on the road, which is really critical when you're off road because you need to see what's coming. And then on on top of that, I also had the two soft flasks in the chest there. Each of these soft flasks is 500 milliliters, so that was an additional liter that I had on my chest. The nice thing with the running vest over a camelback is that the water is more evenly distributed on the front and on the back. The other good thing about these little soft flasks is that if you go through them, you can just kind of crunch them down. They just crunch down really, really small. You can keep an additional one in your bag if you need to. Highly recommended a running vest. Get yourself a bladder in the back there with a hose so you can access that when you're getting bounced around because you can't take your hands off the handlebars for too long and then you can run a couple of bottles on your bike as well so make sure you've got at least three and a half to four liters of water minimum i'd almost recommend four and a half to five if you're prone to sweating a lot Alrighty, so let's move on to my sleep system. Now, as you can see, I'm working my way down from biggest down to smallest here. And this is very applicable to a race situation, but it's not exactly what I'd recommend if you are just going bikepacking. If you're going bikepacking, you might wanna add a tent and a sleeping bag. But this is my setup for Atlas Mountain Race. I took one inflatable sleeping mat. This weighs 510 grams, but you can get them much lighter if you spend much more money. This is a full length one. You can also get the half length ones, which basically just do down to your sort of 
hip or maybe a bit below your hip towards your knees and then your feet are kind of lying on the ground. I find that that's a bit uncomfortable. So I went with a full length one, not too expensive. This was from Decathlon. I used this a couple of times in the race and it was very useful. The only thing with an inflatable mat in a race situation is packing it up and rolling it up and getting all the air out of it takes a little bit of time. The next thing I had is my bivy. Now this is a nice bivy, but it's not the craziest expensive bivy or anything. A bivy is essentially just a waterproof kind of bag. So I lay the bivy down on the ground. I put the inflatable mat inside that and it's just a way to keep sort of moisture and things like that off you on the outside. The only issue with the bivy is they don't breathe that well. So you end up with this kind of condensation inside them, which is not ideal, but in a fast, in a pinch without having to set up a tent, a bivy is a really, really good shout. And I've used that quite a lot. I've got a sleeping bag liner here. Now this is a C to Summit Thermalite Reactor Compact Plus sleeping bag liner. It's very nice and lightweight. A sleeping bag liner is essentially a thin cloth that goes around you. It's like having a sheet on you. And instead of using a sleeping bag, I was using a liner. It's a lot lighter weight and it compacts down a lot smaller. So really nice in a race situation to whip it out. You can use it as a sheet if you want to. It does actually add a couple of degrees to your sleeping bag if you're gonna use it inside a sleeping bag and a really, really good option. So I took that as well. And then for me, an inflatable pillow is a must. This is just a uh, decathlon inflatable pillow that you can get all sorts of inflatable pillows. I cannot sleep without a pillow. So this is very nice and small and it's only 170 grams. So highly recommended some kind of pillow as well. I didn't take a sleeping bag to Atlas and that's an important one that I'll say is that because I didn't take a sleeping bag, I had a bit of extra room in my bag and that's where I could fill my things like my clothes. The reason I didn't take a sleeping bag is because I found that I was gonna be sleeping in just short bursts and I wasn't wanting to pull out a big sleeping bag and set it all up and then pack the whole thing down. But I do own a very nice C to Summit Spark SP two sleeping bag. The Spark range is probably one of the most popular ranges in bikepacking. See the Summit have definitely not given me anything for free to say this, but I really like their range of products. I think they're probably one of the industry leaders in terms of uh, sleeping bags and sleep systems. Okay, now the next thing I wanna talk about, and this is probably the part of the experience that I researched the most about beforehand, and this is my lighting setup. When you're doing ultra races, there are going to be periods where you are riding through the night. It's just unavoidable, and having the right lights for the situation is really, really, really important. I didn't want to run a dynamo setup that would have required swapping out my front hub or finding a dynamo wheel. I went for battery powered lights. Now, some people will say that's stupid because they need recharging and that takes time, extra batteries to recharge and things like that. But that was the option that I went for and I was very happy with my setup in the end. My lighting setup was this. I ran a 1300 lumen light on my handlebars. This is called a Lazine macro drive 1300 XXL and then on my helmet I ran a 1000 lumen light that is called a Lazine multi drive 1000 the reason I ran the two lights is because I could run them both at about a third power and I had enough power between the two lights to be able to see everything you can run a big bright front light you can run it on full power and light up the entire space where you're, you're riding but I found for me I only really needed to see what was kind of in front of me and then when I was going down hills at a higher speed I just turned the power up but by running these decent powerful lights on about a quarter power or a third power, about three to 400 lumens each combination there, I had sort of 700 lumens lighting up the way and that was sufficient for the speed that I was riding at. The other thing is that it's nice to run a headlight as well as an on bar light because when you're going around corners at night with the headlight, you can see where you're going rather than just a handlebar light where you can't turn the bars all the way on the, around the corner to see where you're going. And uh, that combination worked really, really well. One of the things I will say is that with the headlight, it did require an extra battery pack, which actually sat in my running hydration vest. The cool thing with this headlight and this extra battery pack, even though it's extra additional weight, is that it allows you to use this. You can use this as its own battery pack if you need to, to charge other things. So there were actually a couple of times when I used the USB out here to uh, charge a couple of the things that I needed. And I'm gonna speak about the reason that I did that in a second. On top of those front lights, the rear lights that I used, I had a couple of options with me. I ran a uh, Lazine Strip Alert 150, a nice powerful rear light that the battery lasted for ages when I ran it on lower power. But I also turned off my rear lights a lot at night when I was on trails where there were just not gonna be any cars or anyone coming up behind me. I also then had a small decathlon light just as my spare light, which I actually don't think I used at all for the entire race. If you are doing some bike packing and you're not gonna be off-road, you're gonna be on-road, having really good, really reliable front and rear lights is 
absolutely critical for safety, not just so you can see, but so that people can see you. One of the big things with rear lights is obviously you're not looking back behind you, so you're not gonna know if your light's turned off. So having a light with a lot of battery that you know is gonna last all the way through the night if you're riding at night is, is really, really important. I can't stress that enough. Safety first above anything. Okay, so another part of the bikepacking and ultra cycling puzzle is charging gear. Now it's all well and good if you've got a dynamo front hub, you can run uh, your front light off that, you can charge your phone and things like that. I didn't have a dynamo and I didn't wanna build up a dynamo wheel to take on this event. So what I did was I took 50,000 milliamp hours worth of batteries. Now these were really quite heavy batteries. Unfortunately, this one, which was 27,000 milliamp hours, this actually died on the second night after I'd only used a little bit of it. So I pretty much was gonna throw this off the side of that big long road climb that I was at. At about one o'clock in the morning, I was that frustrated. Now the second one that I had, I borrowed off Tom, my flatmate. It's an Anchor, really high quality battery pack. And that thing got me through sweet. The third one I had as a small backup was a 5,000 milliamp hour battery here. This did my phone twice and my Wahoo once in one day. So that was very, very useful to have that as a third backup. The other thing that I have, which I'm really happy that I had is an Anchor 60 watt wall charger. Now the 60 watts that this thing puts out is enough to charge a device quite quickly. Or if you plug in multiple devices, you'll find that you can charge them all at the same time. And it's a lot quicker having 60 watts going through this thing than just a regular two or a three way splitter, which won't give you that much power through each of the, uh, the slots here. I also took three USB-A cables, two USB-C cables, and an iPhone cable that had a USB-C end and an iPhone cable with a USB-A end. The reason I took the two different options was that in case one of the uh, USB-A ports on here died or the USB-C ports died, it meant that I could use the other cable to plug in and, uh, and charge up my phone. Obviously, I was filming a video, so I was recharging my phone quite a lot. I kept my phone on airplane mode most of the time with Bluetooth turned off. That saves a lot of battery, but I still needed to re charge it every night. As I said before, with the light that went on my head, this actually is a small little block uh, itself, this little charging block. It's got a USB out uh, on there. So I was able to use this on the last night as well when I needed to, because I wasn't using the head torch at full power and I knew I had lots of charge in this thing. So I used that to charge, I think my Wahoo and also maybe my phone at one point as well. So that was super, super useful. So yeah, lots of different ways of charging things. I did a lot of research into that. Different things are gonna work for different people. I was very happy with my system and I could have got through basically the entire race without needing to plug anything into the wall had that second charging block not died. That was the thing that frustrated me. So yeah, big learning lesson there. Buy cheap, buy twice. I won't make that mistake again. Let's talk through tools and spares and things like that. I'm gonna start with the first thing. I did take a multi-tool that is an Allen key multi-tool like this. I take this just as a backup, but you know what I take mainly instead is individual Allen keys. For a bikepacking adventure, you really wanna take individual Allen keys as well as a multi-tool like this. The reason why is these things are much easier to get into some of the tighter bolts and uh, the tighter spaces that you might need. So I took a two, three, four, five, and six millimeter Allen key individually like this. Luckily, I didn't have any mechanical issues. A set of tire levers, and I also took three spare Tubalito inner tubes that would have got me out of a sticky situation had I needed them. My bike is set up tubeless, so I also took a tubeless dart system with a bunch of spare plugs in there, so that would have also got me out of a situation. And to pump that up, instead of using one of these, which I do not recommend taking bike packing, don't take CO2s, they weigh a lot, and you just have to discard them after you've used them, I recommend taking a hand pump. So so I had this small hand pump. It wouldn't have been ideal for mountain bike tires, but it would have worked. And you can use this thing as many times as you need to rather than a CO2, which is a one-time use device and it weighs so much. So yeah, no CO2s when you're bike packing. Take a hand pump instead. You'll find you get much better use out of that. A couple of other little things that I took along with me. I took a whole bunch of zip ties. This many zip ties weighs absolutely nothing. They laid in the bottom of my top tube bag and uh, had I needed to zip tie anything to the frame or had anything break, zip ties are always a good idea. A very small bottle of lubricant. This is the little squirt bottle of lubricant. I don't think that squirt lube is that great to be honest. However, I do like this little bottle. It's really, really portable. And one bottle of this got me through five days of riding, although I could have done with a little bit more, but it got me round, so that was all good. Then finally, I had a couple of Wale straps. The Wale straps are kind of rubbery straps. I'll put a, the name down on the screen so you can see it there. I took two of those, and actually in the first few days, I had a set of flip-flops Wale straps 
strapped to the outside of my rear bag, which I ended up getting rid of about halfway through the race because I wasn't liking them being on my bag. They were kind of annoying and I realized I was never gonna use flip-flops in this race anyway. Down to the final little things, I had a spare cleat and a spare cleat bolt in this bag. Really important to take a spare cleat and cleat bolt because if your cleat breaks, falls out, whatever, having that will be a lifesaver and a cleat and cleat bolt don't weigh anything. I had a spare chain link in there. I had a couple of tire boots that I made out of an old inner tube that I cut up and uh, just had some strips of inner tube just in case I'd had a slash in the side of my tire. And then on top of that, I also had a spare derailleur hanger. Very, very useful when you're in the middle of nowhere. If you break your derailleur hanger, you need to have a spare on there and that'll save a complete uh, nightmare and be a real peace of mind. Okay, so on to a couple of the safety things. And by safety, I mean comfort as well as safety. My first aid kit, I took a bunch of bandages. I took some betadine cream, which was really, really important had I cut myself. The Panthen, this is really, really good for putting on saddle sores and uh, any skin repair that you need to do. On top of that, things like hand sanitization gel is really, really important. I took a bunch of lip balm, which I actually ended up using a lot. You can see towards the end of the race, my lips were absolutely cracked and chapped. One thing that might interest people is I don't use chamois cream and I didn't use chamois cream at all during this event. I haven't used chamois cream for probably the last six or seven years. I'm gonna say something that you guys might find controversial, but this is the way that it works for me. I find chamois cream does the opposite of what I want it to do. When I run chamois cream, it softens up the skin where I'm sitting and that means that I just get worse rubbing. Over years and years and years of riding, I found that not running chamois cream and just having a very good chamois and a saddle that I fit well with saves me from getting saddle sores. It's not the chamois cream that saves me from getting saddle sores. So I don't run chamois cream and didn't take any along with me, which probably blows a few people's minds, but that's the way I do it. On top of that, the last thing I took, which I do recommend is a life straw. Now I did have access to clean water. I didn't end up using the life straw at all, but had I been stuck somewhere and I really, really needed to drink from a creek or something like that, not that there were many, I could have used the life straw. So highly recommended pop a life straw in your bag. Okay, now just another couple of extra little safety things. Sunscreen is really, really important. I use Pelotan sunscreen. This comes in a sash. It's not available for sale yet. These are pre-production versions, but Pelotan in a sachet is really good for bikepacking because it doesn't weigh anything. But also when you first pack them, they don't take up any space at all. I took three or four of these. I think I went through two or three of them. I also took a bunch of baby wipes as well. And one last thing that I took, which might surprise you guys, is this uh, dental floss. I took dental floss with me, not to floss my teeth, but so that I could sew up the side of my tire had I had any big slashes. I took a needle along with me and had I had a big slash in the side of my tire, I could have used the dental floss to sew that up. Uh, dental floss is quite strong, so being able to sew up the side of your tire if you get a big slash is quite a useful thing to have. So yeah, chuck a bit of dental floss in your first aid kit there as well. Okay, so just a quick discussion about the way that I navigated. Now this obviously comes under electronics, but I'm gonna talk about it separately. As you would have seen in the video, I had a couple of issues with the two Wahoos I took. I took my small Wahoo bolt and I also took a Wahoo Element Roam. Now both of those devices had some sorts of issues through the race. If you've watched the video, you would have seen where that happened and what happened. It was incredibly frustrating when it happened, but those were the two devices that I've used. I do wanna say that up until I did the Atlas Mountain Race, I never had any issues with Wahoo. Wahoo has actually been an excellent device for me over the last few years. It was just a shame that they sort of collapsed in the middle of those big long days. So yeah, that was the navigation devices that I used. I am looking into maybe also purchasing a Garmin 1030 or 1040 Solar, which is the solar powered Garmin units. I think those are a really interesting idea for bikepacking when you're doing long days. Having the unit itself charged by solar power will mean that you don't need to plug anything in or at least you get a bit of extra battery life out of your units if you're in the sun all day. But the Wahoos were great until those issues happened. Another small electronic element that I do want to mention is the fact that I took some AirPods Pro. Now, I don't recommend using AirPods that often because they use Bluetooth and that's gonna suck battery out of both your phone and the AirPods themselves. Use a regular set of wired headphones. The reason I like the AirPods Pro for bikepacking though is because what you can do is you can put them in your ears, turn on noise cancelling, and what it does is it gets rid of that wind noise, that constant wind noise 
noise that you have going past your ears. And it just kind of helped me get into a really nice rhythm without being distracted and having this kind of wind rushing over my ears. And then another thing that I also used a bit was my watch. Now the watch, I didn't actually use it to record any of the uh, rides, but what I did use it for was to keep on my wrist. And so every time I stopped, I could look at the time and see how long I might've been stopped for. As it turns out, that didn't really make much of a difference because I had so much time stopping. My entire race plan went out the window in terms of stopping for as short a time as possible. A couple of last little things to mention because I realized I've forgotten brevet card, really important to keep this in one piece so you can get it stamped and get your results at the end of the race. All races will have a brevet card. So you need to keep that in one piece. The way I do that is keeping it with my passport inside a Ziploc bag and I kept that in my top tube bag so I knew exactly where it was every time I got to the checkpoints. In case anyone's wondering, I film all of my vlogs with a combination of my iPhone and a GoPro. All of the footage you see basically is straight out of my iPhone. It's got three different lens options on there. Obviously you got wide, medium and long so you can film 99% of the stuff with that. The only stuff I can't film with my phone is actually the descending footage at high speed and that's where having a GoPro with this pro standard mouth mount is really important. All of the descending footage that you see where I have two hands on the handlebars and also for that river crossing that was filmed with the GoPro in my mouth. I had the GoPro kind of tucked in my in the uh, side of my running vest here. It was very difficult to get out especially when my wrist was sore so the annoying thing about it was that when I did want to use it I had to come to a complete stop, pull it out, put it in my mouth and go again whereas the iPhone having it in my cargo bib shorts pocket there I can just whip it out film really quickly and then pop it back in my pocket and the final thing I'll mention is the fact that I had a couple of clothes that I didn't end up using I had a very lightweight pair of shorts I had a very thin t-shirt as well neither of those I ended up using I just stayed in the same kit for five days it did stink by the end as I said before I'm gonna retire that kit now so there you have it that's my complete bikepacking setup I hope you guys got something out of this video as I said before there's no right or wrong bikepacking setups and everyone has a different idea of what works. If you guys have got some ideas as to how best to improve my bikepacking setup, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you've got any questions about any of the things I've discussed, please leave a comment down below as well. I hope you guys have enjoyed it and I'll see you all in another episode of Tristan Take Video very soon. All right, there you go.